welcome to everyone who who came today. Uh, really excited to have you here. Um, what we'd like to do, so let me give you a, an overview of what we're what we're going to try and do today, um, and that is really to sort of convey our what we've learned over collectively. Uh, hard to hard to wrap my brain around this, but collectively about seventy years of teaching physiology. Um, and so we've, we've sort of honed a, a philosophical approach over those years. Um, and what we like to do is sort of start with that after my brief introduction here, um, really give you, a, give you a feel for what that philosophy entails, um, what it means in terms of students, student learning, uh, and what, they, what we would like them to walk away with. Um, in addition, at, like sort of after that introduction to the philosophy, um, we would like to give some examples of how that philosophy is employed, right? We're always like, we can always give you the broad picture, but you know, everybody wants to know the details of how you actually, how you actually do that. And we've got a few examples, I think that might help um, sort of connect the dots for people. Uh, and, and another note, um, we're, we, Jerry and I are both very casual guys. So um, if you have a question along the way, feel, uh, feel free to throw it into the chat or even unmute and ask us. Um, we have no problem sort of addressing questions and comments as they come up. Um, with that, let me, let me introduce myself just a little bit. Um, I, I, my parents would probably say that I was a biologist at, by about the age of one. Um, I was one of those kids that was interested in everything creepy crawly. Um, very interested in insects growing up. Um, I was actually amateur entomologist of Pennsylvania, believe it or not, uh, in like 1980 or something like that. Um, and that just, that just, you know, sort of kept rolling um, and ended up doing uh, both undergraduate and, undergraduate and graduate work in biology with, with uh, focus in physiology um, at the University of Delaware. Um, did a lot of research there as an undergraduate um, it was comparative physiology, so I worked in reptiles largely, um, studying the renin angiotensin system, um, and then went on to do um, graduate work there in, this, in the same system. Um, did postdocs, kind of moved from, from comparative physiology to mammalian physiology in my postdocs. Um, and, and really the reason to point this out is that it's it's our experiences have honed our approaches. And I think the comparative aspect of actually both of our, Jerry will speak in a minute, but um, both of our, our backgrounds really does, really does help us, um, we, we believe in, in how we teach our courses, um, gives us more, a little bit more broader perspective, which is really useful, I think. Um, but let me turn it over to Jerry for a minute, let him say a few words about himself. Uh, firstly, th <clears throat> thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I'm Jerry Robinson. Just a few things about myself. Uh, like Eric, I grew up in, in Pennsylvania, central PA, and uh, just an average kid. Uh, went to college in my hometown school, which was Lock Haven State. Uh, graduated with a BA in biology in 1970, then moved on immediately to Penn State, uh, where I ultimately got my PhD in 1975. It was at Penn State that I had my first physiology courses and I had a bunch of them. Uh, that's where I really developed a passion for physiology. I, I knew that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And uh, basically my training was mostly comparative physiology, but I had an awful lot of mammalian physiology. Uh, Right after finishing my degree in 75, I went to Fordham University as a faculty member for two years. And there I taught mammalian physiology, vertebrate anatomy, basic biology. Uh, we only stayed in New York for two years, but then I moved on to Towson in Baltimore and spent the rest of my career there until my retirement in 1970 or uh, 20, 2012. Uh, in the course of my career, I've taught courses in mammalian physiology, comparative physiology, human anatomy and physiology, assorted other courses, graduate, undergraduate level. And my research uh, basically focused always on salt and water balance in aquatic, estuarine, and marine animals. I've studied uh, everything from crabs to, to newts, 
uh, sea snakes to terrapins, uh, really a fun ride. Uh, wanted to say something about myself also before we go further. Uh, people that know me well know I'm pretty, pretty soft-spoken, pretty, pretty shy. When I got my job at Fordham, uh, I was going to be teaching vertebrate anatomy. I wanted so badly to do it well. And in the weeks before the semester started, I researched my lectures. Uh, I typed them out on three by five cards. I was going to be ready to go. I was going to do a great job. I was a bit nervous because I had no experience giving lectures at all. And anyway, I walked into the first class thinking everything was going to go awesome. And I had my three by five cards. There were only about 20 students in the room. But I realized uh, <laughs> things weren't going well. I, I had the cards in front of me. And I looked at the first card and it said, introduce yourself. And so I said, hi, I'm Jerry Robinson. And then I flipped to the next card. And then it said, welcome to the students to the, to the class. And I did that. And what I realized is what students see when <laughs> you're standing up there. I mean, I, I, I could see the expression on their faces. It's like, what is it with this guy? And uh, the lecture is pretty awful, to be honest with you. So I went back to my office, uh, really, really upset, tears in my eyes. I went home that night, talked to my wife. And I said, Vicki, if I can't do a better job than this, I, I can't teach. So I made up my mind to try to memorize the next lecture. And I had two days to do it. It was awful. I mean, I, I spent a long time. And I kept testing myself until I could basically write the thing out longhand. Went in the next uh, class with no notes, gave the lecture, and it was so much better. And I could see it from the looks on the students' faces as well. So I knew I had a system. And the reason I'm telling you the story is I ran out pretty quickly of pre-prepared lectures. So I got pretty fast into the mode where I had to write the lectures and then memorize them. And I was just a little bit ahead of the students in that. What I found was, because I knew I was gonna to have to memorize the lectures, if I wrote them in a certain way, they were easier to memorize. And that depended on everything being organized, uh, a story to be told, break points at appropriate intervals so that uh, so I could actually go from one, one topic to the next as, as appropriate. Uh, so what I was doing is I was learning to tell the story and actually prepare to tell the story in the way I wrote the lectures. And that basically carried me through the whole rest of my career. And uh, what Eric and I are going to share with you today, it, it, it relates to that, but we've got other things that we've thought about also that we want to share with you all as well. So anyway, thanks for being here. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Ooh. There we go. Um, so what we, uh, one of the things that, you know, Jerry sort of related with that story is this is this sort of gap, right? This this realization that we we had as uh, early instructors, right? And and many of you may have sort of had the same realization, and that's that what you're trying to give, convey to them, and what they're actually taking away, are are often two different things. And so our whole our whole story here, our whole point of of providing this this webinar is to try to convey what we've learned and how to, to span that gap. In other words, how, to, how do you get to the students so that you reach them on their level and have them, um, have them walk away with more than, or have them walk away with what you're trying to have them walk away with, if that makes sense, right? In other words, we walk into a class and there's, a, there's an enormous difference, and we're gonna come back to this in a minute, but there's an enormous difference between telling people about physiology and explaining physiology. And it's this subtle difference that I, that, I, that I struggle to sort of convey to people, like what does it actually mean? And that's what we're gonna try and do is to sort of tell you what the difference between those two sort of deliveries are, um, because we think it is like, we at least have come to the conclusion that it is the end all be all of, 
of sort of teaching physiology effectively, like that transition between telling people physiology and explaining physiology. So again, we have to understand what that gap is. And then we need to figure out, right? Because at the bottom there, what do I need to write down for the test, right? They're trying to, they're trying to figure out what they need to know. And you're trying to not just give them what they need to know in terms of answering questions, but in terms of understanding the, the logic of physiology. So let's roll on, right? So this is how, uh, what I've got here is a simple memorization test. Now, this is my example of my analogy of how many students view physiology, right? We've got this list of words that are, some of them might be jargon to the students. Um, and in their heads, they, they have this list of words. It's like, okay, well, I need to learn what each of these words means, each one of these physiological like facts or concepts is. But what they don't see and what they can't do is, first of all, they can't, they don't see the importance of one relative to the other and they can't integrate them. They, they don't see how they fit together, right? And so if I were to give you know, students or, or, or you guys a test, like give you a big long list of words and say, okay, tomorrow we have a test on these, you have to memorize as many as you can and you know, regurgitate, regurgitate them tomorrow. I'd personally be hard pressed to you know, pass a, an exam like that or a quiz like that. Whereas if we do this with those same words, right? We reorganize those. And again, the words are representing physiological facts and concepts here. But in this scenario, we've taken those, those facts and concepts and we've put them together logically, sequentially to tell a story, right? So now what happens is number one, they're going to recall those, those facts and concepts more readily, right? They're, they're within a framework that they now understand, right? But that's the other part that they now have because now they have an understanding of something greater. They have a story to which they're, they're inserting these, these physiological concepts and facts, right? The facts are part of a greater story, like the characters in a, in a movie, right? We know what roles they're playing and we know uh, how they contribute to the, to the conclusion of the story. So that's really one of the key things that we've, we've sort of come across and attempted to do in our teaching. Now, the, the question becomes at some point, like how, right? Like, how do you, how do, you uh, do that? And let's, let's see if we can get there. Joe, is there anything else you wanted to add here? Yeah, I just wanna say the cool thing is use the uh, instructor or the one that has the wherewithal to show the students how to do this. And you can do it in the way you put your lectures together. So I think they kind of feed off of your approach. Absolutely, I agree. <clears throat> the, more, the more your approach shifts to the storytelling, the conveyance of logic, the more they see that as the course goals. Uh, and, they, and they realize that this is the, right, as opposed to like, what am I supposed to write down for the test kind of attitude. Okay, so our, our view of the problem is that when they don't have that, that, overriding concept um, logic of a, of a physiological story um, that they're gonna rely on memorization, right? Um, and so what happens a lot of times is with lacking this sort of framework of a story. Um, number one, I, I mean, the realization that I came to after sort of lots of conversations with my students over the years was that I felt like I wasn't really giving them anything. Right, I could convey the content of physiology quite effectively. I got really good at it. Like Jerry was saying he did, right? Got really good at it. Um, you were complete. Um, the, you, you had all the sequential steps in a physiological process laid out, right? It was beautiful. And then you start to think, well, what are they actually getting from this, right? What are they taking away? And, it, and oftentimes it, it's not what we think. It's, it, it's the steps. It's the, it's the steps without the meaning, right? It's, it's you know, I can, I can explain the steps of, a, of an action potential, right? You walk into a physiology class and, and ask, you know, ask the students about what voltage gated channels are doing or lag end gated channels are doing, um, you know, what is an action potential, right? They can, they can kind of convey these things. They can give you the, the, the sort of the what and the how of, of physiological content. Ask them what an action potential is for, and sometimes you get sort of blank stares, right? They've like, they're lost in the, in the forest. They can, you know, the, they can't see the forest for the trees, right? They're stuck in all the details um, and they're missing the broader picture, right? And so, you know, we've sort of flipped things a little bit and try to give that broader meaning first so that everything else fits into a framework. 
I like to say it's kind of like, um, you know, putting uh, ornaments on a Christmas tree. Without, without the tree, there's not much of a Christmas tree, right? In other words, you have all the details, the ornaments, but without them being organized onto the, onto the tree, the framework of the, of the system, um, the students are left sort of memorizing lots of individual things. Right. What I wanted to say is uh, one of the things I loved about teaching at Towson was that you you were the lab instructor as well as the lecturer. So if I had three sections of uh, anatomy, physiology, two students, I taught them lectures three hours a week, but I met them for three hours per section in lab. And uh, so I got a chance to talk with the students. And occasionally I'd go to a lab table and the students would say, hey, you don't use any notes. How, how do you do that? And I said, well, I, you know, I found out that if I write the lectures in an organized way, I could remember everything. And oh, I said, I'll show you how I do it. And I would sit down with a blank sheet of paper and I would take the lecture we just did. And I basically outline what all the points were that were made and I'd say, each of these major points, all I had to do in my mind was fill in the details. So it was basically, I was telling the story and it was easy. And they loved that. And I think it helped them to study. It taught them how to study the effect uh, more effectively. So our solution um, that Jerry and I sort of independently came to is this, this greater focus on the why. Um, you know, we, at being more senior faculty members, um, Jerry is actually emeritus at this point. Um, but we've observed a lot of a lot of junior faculty members. It's one of the things that we do at, at Towson and a lot of other schools, I'm sure. Um, but sort of observe the junior faculty and give them feedback. And one of the things that I always observe, not always, but frequently observed, is that a lot of junior faculty tend to get sort of hung up on the the what and the how, right? And and oftentimes the textbooks are really good at supporting that. They, they, they tend to convey the content of physiology. Um, you know, for instance, the, you know, homeostasis is a simple example, right? Homeostasis being the what, uh, negative feedback loops being the how, you know, with all the inherent details of those. The why is often missing though, right? And it's sort of like, without the why, they're learning this stuff, but they don't know why they're learning it. Right. And so we, we always try to like, and we can do this with big, broad concepts like homeostasis, where you're, you want to give them the why. So it's like, you know, as they're going through the cardiovascular system and the renal system and the pulmonary system, it's like, you know, you can keep coming back and pointing to homeostasis. Um, but, you know, the, there's a there's logic between the sequential events of, of excitation contraction and muscle right in muscle dynamics and so there's a logic to the sequence of those even molecular steps and so we're always trying to convey that that why and and again you know to come back to the homeostasis for just a second you know a lot of a lot of people don't teach that a big chunk of homeostasis is really all about maintenance of of protein stability and function right it might be a sort of an offhand comment but if you think about it Right, regulating carbon dioxide levels and waste levels and, and even osmolarity and electrolyte levels, a lot of these things have to do with maintaining protein stability um, and therefore function. And so without that, they sort of like lost, you know, they, they're studying these things, but again, they don't know exactly what the broader point is. And um, again, so we try to bring it back to that sort of what I call the adaptive logic. Like what's the, what's the evolutionary gist of everything that we teach so that, and there's a lot of very intuitive physiology. They're very, it's kind of infrequent that you find physiological functions where you're like, you know, you get down to the nitty gritty and it's still sort of like coming back to you like that doesn't make any sense at all, right? Usually there's a, there's a place where you can, if you dive deep enough, you can find the logic. Um, and then, then the, the skill is sort of like bring it to the right level eliminate the details you don't need to and, and convey that logic to the students. Yeah, we all know as physiologists that we need to tie things together to really do a good job studying the field. And as Eric uh, is saying, you know, that, you know, addressing that question of why on every phenomenon that you look at, that's your key to being able to tie it together. What is one organ system doing what it's doing? 
while the other one's doing its thing and so on and so forth. So why is so important? So what are our sort of pedagogical solutions? So we're getting more specific, like what are the kinds of things that we've sort of evolved to do to, to convey this, you know, or, or execute this philosophical approach to teaching physiology? And so I want to run you through a, a short list here, and then we'll give you some examples that sort of match up with these. Um, but number one up there, the first bullet, regularly employing unifying principles. Uh, I always found that, like for example, diffusion. Diffusion kind of shows up in, in courses and in textbooks that are at one place, right? It, it, it pops up in an early chapter, and the factors that affect diffusion, you know, are sort of conveyed. And honestly, I, you know, the longer I taught physiology, the more I was like, well, many organ systems exist. Like literally they evolved in support of actions to, the wording this is difficult, but so in other words, the weakness of diffusion over distance is a, is a physiological challenge. And many organ systems exist, evolved, right? Adaptively to overcome that, that weakness of diffusion. I mean, again, think about it. Microvilli in the lining of the GI, surface area for diffusion. Microvilli in the proximal convoluted tubule of the, of the nephron, surface area for um, diffusion. Uh, alveolar surface area, the respiratory membrane, enormous surface area for diffusion, right? We could get into the, the distances minimized and, and all sorts of things, and it, but it keeps coming back to the factors within fixed laws of diffusion. And so, you know, that's an enormous one where we can, and again, there are other, you know, unifying principles that we, tr we try to keep coming back to structure, function, uh, you know, linkage. We're big fans of J.D. Bernal and Max Perutz. Um, uh, the driving force of energetics in the evolution of a lot of uh, uh, physiological systems. Um, physiological plasticity, lots of these things where, right, and, and what's the mediator of plasticity? It's like sort of like well, how any organism like solves a problem where something has changed, right? Like how do we, how are they resolving this problem, at least a, a more chronic problem? And it revolves around plasticity, which really revolves around changes in protein expression. Providing those principles on the regular gives students a meaning behind the content they're learning. Um, and we, do, we try to do that in a lot of different places. Um, just to keep rolling here, uh, addressing historical errors or misconceptions. Um, you know, in, in over the years of our, our teaching and studying physiology, right, there's a lot of places where you find that there's like, his, I call it historical inertia, things that have not evolved with the changes in the, in the current literature. Um, I'll use capillary flux as an example a little bit later on. Uh, another tool we, we use is deconstructing and then reconstructing complex topics. Uh, the Wiggers diagram is a good example there that uh, if you're not familiar with the name, uh, that's the diagram that shows the electrocardiogram and the, and the pressure traces and the volume traces for the cardiac cycle. Um, providing mental chunking tools. Um, there's a reason why, and we've gotten away from this obviously, but there's a reason why phone numbers had hyphens in them. Right, it, it, like everybody knows that there were hyphens in phone numbers. We don't need them now because no one remembers phone numbers anymore, right? But social security numbers had hyphens. That's chunking, right? That's where things are better retained by the human mind when they are linked in groups, right? It, numbers, that's simple. We're just minimizing that. We're just chunking them within a smaller group. But we can do that with, with, with physiological content where we tie together um, functional units into these quote unquote chunks. And then they're not learning, you know, disparate facts, they're learning them together as units. Simplifying before elaborating, really love the example of blood pressure control, right? We all give tons of example, not examples, but, but components of uh, blood pressure control. The overview of that is, is amazingly simple. And if you provide that first, everything else falls into that, that simple, really simple overview. Um, guiding student thinking, right? True application questions. It's really essential that we step away from what Jerry and I refer to as sort of the low hanging fruit, right? It's very easy to, to teach physiological content and then ask them about that content. 
And again, if we're going to, if you buy into the idea that we want them to have application skills, critical thinking skills, then they need to be able to integrate that information, which means they need practice. They need to be pushed to think about what we teach in that logical framework, not just recalling factual content. Um, and the last one there, uh, covering topics essential to normal function, which are sometimes overlooked. Uh, the example I'll, I'll give is the Ferris Lindquist effect. And I, I put this in the category of teaching things that if they didn't exist, we'd be dead, right? It's sort of like there are, there are just sort of physiological functions that aren't often taught that Jerry and I think should be. Um, and they don't have to be all that complicated. This is one that's probably left out because people think it is too complicated. But there are ways to sort of simplify it, not give all of the crazy detail, but give enough detail that they understand how essential it is to function. Jerry, was there anything else you wanted to add there? Um, I, I have a few comments, but I think I'll save them for as we go through the visuals. Yeah. All right. So what's our what's our problem with many books? And I, I you know, we love a lot of physiology books. Um, but one of the problem with a lot of books is that they, with the expansion of content knowledge, they've sort of logically and, and rationally, in many cases, sort of added that content. And so they become sort of physiological encyclopedias, right? They, they again, they're better at telling students the steps in an action potential than logically conveying why those dominoes fall in the order they fall in. And there's a there's a difference there. It's like some people might think like, oh, well, that's more than my students need. And it's like, well, it's more explanation, but the goal, the outcome is so much has so much more potential, right? Because you sort of like say, well, I can't teach you know well, the linkages. I can't I can't spend time on all that. Our our view is that if you don't do that, what we're doing, and we did it, right? But if you don't do that, what you're doing is sort of like delegating yourself to sort of content dispersal. That's where I, you know, I walk out of those lectures and you're like, wow, I was not telling the story. All I did was stir the air in the room, right? The students walked away with like, they're like, well, what? I don't know. I'll write down the keywords and I'll figure out what it means later, right? We don't want to do that, right? We want to we want to convey the logic so that they can step away from memorization and logically think about how these systems function and why they function that way. Are there compounding factors? You bet. Um, you know, a lot of you guys are are busy, right? Uh, you've got a lot of things going on. Do you have time to become an expert? I was an expert in in renal physiology, quasi a little bit in cardiovascular phys. Did I know anything about digestion when I started teaching anatomy and physiology or other courses in physiology? Not really, right? Did I know anything about immunity? No, not at all, right? And I can go on and on, right? So it's like, you need the book that conveys the logic to you so you can convey the logic to them, right? And that's sort of what we've, we've tried to, to provide here. And, and it's, that is the challenge. Um, but anyway, um, you know, young faculty walk in and are given a syllabus and they think, you know, or a content list. And it's like, okay, this is the, this is the Bible. I got to follow this, right? This is the list of things I have to have to do. And you can't teach all the physiology, right? You, and, and you shouldn't try, right? What our view is that you should try to teach students to think about physiology and then whatever you cover, you cover. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, within reason, but still it, We'd rather be, you know, marginally good at conveying the logic of physiology and having students develop those critical thinking skills than be phenomenal at conveying content and have them walk away with trivia, essentially. You know, they're good at, at trivia questions. Um, you know, I, I, without that sort of why, you end up teaching physiological phenomena and then you end up memorizing. Um, and of course, we don't the critical thinking abilities don't develop. Um, writing the last one there, writing the new book is hard. Oh, heck yeah, it is. Um, again, if you're, if, I mean, maybe someone more skilled at it would have been faster, but um, you know, it took Jerry and I, we've been working on this for a decade. Um, and a lot of that was, is literally right. There's a, there's a prep time and, you know, find the level, find the approach, 
period of a few years, but most of that is spent trying to develop the content. And most of that is really about trying to get those explanations. People say, well, how's it different? Right. It's like, oh, like they expect the pages to be all pink or something, right? It's something like blatant and screams out at you. And it's not until you start reading. Right. And then it becomes, well, they've got the logic into the explanation so that you can stop memorizing. That's really the goal. Um, and that was the that was the challenge for us. Jerry, did you and, want to add anything there? Yeah, I think every instructor feels the pressure to get through the syllabus. I mean, cover everything the syllabus says you need to cover. And it'd be tempting to say, okay, with that pressure, I'm gonna cover this material, maybe not take the time to address the logic and the why as Eric's talking about. And it might seem like the easiest way to go, but the fact is in, in the long run, it hurts everybody because uh, the students don't get out of it what they should have, and that's gonna come back and haunt them uh, down the road. So yeah, it's walking a tight rope, but I think it's an important tight rope to walk. Yeah, and I, I, I'm to jump in after that. I know I'm being a little bit redundant with what's coming up, our summary, but it is infinitely more fun to teach, try to teach, right? Because it's a challenge. Try to teach that logic behind everything than it is to convey content. It's just so much more fun. It's, it, it's more fun because it's hard. Um, but, you know, we're sort of throwing that out as the challenge to people to say, hey, you know, if you're not already doing this, it's a worthwhile, you know, endeavor. Um, and again, let's let's get to some of those examples here in a second. We can we can expound a little bit. Um, so <laughs> the hard part, let us count the ways. Um, I was sort of already saying that it's explaining explaining is the difficult art. That's a quote I stole from Richard Dawkins. Um, but I like I like that quote because it's it's defining conveyance of logic as an art and meaning that for me at least that you have to become very creative in how you how you package your delivery right you have to find ways to convey that it's easy to convey the content of again coming back to it easy to convey the content the components of an ad potential it's real right i mean there's an order these are the components this is, the, this is how the dominoes fall. It's much more difficult to convey the logic of, of why myelin exists or why nodes exist or why, you know, like, sort, all sort, like what, what about the energetics? Why not myelinate everything? Like there's a thousand different things you can get into there. Um, but if you focus on that why, then, they, then they're not left with simply sort of like, well, here's the content and this is the order. Right. If you want to, if they, you want them to understand how neurotoxins work, and they understand the order in which the dominoes fall and why they fall in that order, guess what? How neurotoxins work becomes a becomes a logic challenge to them. Right. It's not they're not memorizing like oh Botox does blank or tetrodotoxin does you know blank. Then it becomes aha right. And you don't. I tell them what the neurotoxin does. But if they understand the sequence and the logic of the sequence, then they can dissect the response to that neurotoxin, right? That's, that's useful information, right? Because now they have an analytical ability. They picked up a skill, not content knowledge. Um, so again, the, the fundamental shift in the approach, uh, we've tried to sort of, not that we tried to, it's just, it matches up with this philosophy, but sort of everything is a little bit different than what you're, you're used to seeing. Uh, the text, the art, the questions, definitely the questions. Um, you know, why did it take this long? Why do I, why, you know, why did I need to prepare to write each chapter? And, and just for reference, I ended up writing this sort of first drafts and Jerry was sort of my primary editor and we went back and forth and back and forth. That's why I'm saying I here. Um, but initially when I, when I would write a, the draft of a chapter, to convey the, right? We're not all experts in all areas. And so I felt the need to become as best I could an expert in every single bloody topic in physiology, right? Which means I read, you know, in the last seven years, I read 30 physiology textbooks or a large part of many of them and, and 10,000 papers and whatever else it took, right? Because it, I, I'm one of those people that like, I don't learn if I don't understand. I'm horrible at memorization, right? And so 
what like I needed to prepare this well for the writing of each of these chapters because I couldn't convey the logic if I didn't, in which case I'd be dumping content, not understanding. And I just, I'm, that's not the way my brain works. I can't, I can't do it. So, um, so I, hopefully that's a good thing for people. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely why it took so long to do it. Eric, uh, so, <clears throat> sorry, but I have to embarrass you a little bit. Uh, I've watched this man write this book for 10 years, worked with him very closely every day. And what he has done is so monumental. Uh, he basically made himself an expert in every organ system. And as he said, read, read countless uh, research papers, textbooks. It's, it's just a phenomenal accomplishment. I want to compliment you publicly, Eric. I mean, just an awesome appreciate accomplishment. It, yep. I appreciate that. And, and together, I think we've come up with something that I, that I hope a lot of people will really not, not just appreciate, but like find is really useful, right? Because I, I, it, I think we'd be hard pressed to ask somebody, you know, oh, you know, we're, our goal is to help you, you know, convey more understanding and develop more application skills. Well, who's going to say no to that, right? It's sort of like, it, then the question becomes, well, do you think that you think we've accomplished that? And do you think the tools that we're providing, you know, really do promote that? Um, and you know we hope so, but um, but that was the goal was to sort of do something different that challenges students to go to another level, um, and to a level that's not necessarily high level. Let me let me throw that out here, right? This is a book that draft versions of this book that that I've personally used at 200 level and 400 level, right? So sophomores and seniors essentially. And it's all about like what you require, right? It, it's all about like the levels of, of uh, what you expect in terms of their application abilities. And so again, if you're conveying the logic, well, you can stick with like, okay, uh, my a and students, it's like, I, need, I want you to understand the, the adaptive logic and how these things work and why they work that way. Well, in my 400 level, I'm expecting that, I might review that, but now it's more about the application, right? Now they're now I'm gonna bring in more of the neurotoxins and the other things and sort of like, I, I expect them to use the information more so than the, than the lower level. But the, but the logic is the logic. It's almost like we, without the details we provided, you know, I think in many cases, we'd be leaving that logic out, right? There's a place where the logic becomes apparent and we tried to include that. Eric, you mentioned having fun uh, several times now. Uh, I just wanted to kind of jump in on that. All of us at this webinar today uh, love physiology. I mean, I always used to say to people, I am so lucky to have physiology, physiology to teach because it is so cool. And I'm sure physicists felt the same way about their field, chemists, the same thing. But I truly thought physiology was just the greatest topic there is. And uh, the thing has happened with Eric and me in working on this book is we've had fun just going back and forth with each other, you know, you, you know, talking about different phenomena, what makes them happen, uh, raising questions and trying to answer questions about you know, why it was doing what it was, that type of thing. I mean, it's fun. It's fun to talk with people about physiology. It's fun to teach it. And the more you think about the why and the logic, uh, the better. So it, Jerry, Jerry coined a term uh, a few years ago with me and I, I, it sticks in my head. That one of the things that we're trying to do is um, have students uh, become more intellectually aggressive. I really like that term because it's like the, you know, seeking that understanding. And Jerry and I, I was lucky to have Jerry as a colleague for years and years. Um, we were just those people that like bounced ideas off each other like incessantly, right? And I think that's that is what brought us to the point where we felt like a lot of in many ways that that our personalities and also that sort of you know habit we have of sort of like, well, I don't understand this. I need to get to the point where I can understand it so I can convey it, so I can teach it. And, you know, having that intellectual aggressiveness is really important. And again, I think it's really important to, to try to instill that in our students, right? If they think it's just a big, you know, task of memorization, they're going to, they're going to hate it in many ways. Um, 
And again, the students that really need that content and, and an understanding of that content, are, you're gonna be shortchanging them. All right, so we're ready for a couple of examples. Um, I don't wanna get bogged down. Well, we can move through these reasonably quickly. Um, I know we're already eating up three quarters of an hour here. Um, but I do wanna sort of convey the examples a little bit so that we can maybe give you some rationale for what we're doing, just some practical examples of what we're doing. Um, here's one, and I don't think we need to go too far in depth with this. This is, this is our, our just a, a, a figure showing fixed law and the components within fixed law, or one version of fixed law. And you know, we use this as one of our um, unifying principles, right? And instead of just teaching diffusion, sort of like, well, you know, why are capillaries, you know, fractions of a millimeter from nearly every cell in our body, right? The weakness of, of diffusion over distance. You know, why does carbon dioxide diffuse one way and oxygen another? Well, because the gradients are, you know, directed in opposite directions and that's what drives diffusion and, and so on and so forth. The examples I gave earlier about microvilli and things like that, that just pop up in all different organ systems. Um, and again, this is simply one example of unifying, unifying principle, um, you know, stimulus response, uh, you know, the evolution and the adaptive logic of, of physiological responses. Um, I, had, I heard a really cool one the other day, um, somebody describing a lot of, a lot of physiology as, as sort of involving tubes, right? And it's sort of like, hmm, like why all these tubes? And it's like, well, it, it comes back to that exchange with the environment again, right? Like our body is like got these multiple invaginations for a variety of purposes. Um, and again, a lot of those come down to, to diffusion and, and protecting epithelial surfaces and things like that. But um, that's just one example of a, of a unifying principle that we use. Another thing I remember as an undergrad, had an instructor talking about diffusion, gave an example of uh, his example of diffusion was if he lit a cigarette at one end of the room, if you could smell the smoke X amount of time later, that was diffusion. And that's legitimate. It, it, it's true about diffusion, but the fact is uh, <clears throat> it, it, diffusion needs to be quantified in physiology because uh, diffusion speed, the rate of diffusion, the difference between having it fast enough and not is the difference between life and death. So as you look at this model for fixed law, if you have a, a diffusion distance that's too great because of pulmonary edema, guess what? You die. You can't exchange O2 and CO2 fast enough. So here, you know, here's a case where you know putting in enough detail to understand the logic and the application, um, you, you got to have it. Otherwise, you get a problem. Yeah, and and another thing to, too, just to bring back Jerry's example, there is the is sort of the the misapplication of examples sometimes. Like Jerry's example of of diffusion in air as sort of well, this is what diffusion means works really really poorly for physiology students because almost all diffusion in a physiological setting is aqueous. Well, guess what? Aqueous diffusion is approximately 10,000 fold slower than diffusion in air. So it's like, it's just this enormous difference in the, the, the density of the, the two mediums, uh, you know, just a lot of different things that are sort of misconstrued. And, and again, by trying to, I, I remember reading, um, I literally read, I wanna call it a book, but it wasn't a book. It was like an 80 page chapter on diffusion. And it was like, it was like reading a, it, most of it was in Greek letters, right? Because it was all math equations. And it's like my mind was like melting trying to comprehend that. But I beat myself through it so that I could get to the gist of what I needed to know about diffusion to convey it logically and accurately within the physiological setting. A lot of people use temperature as a major driving force for, you know, enhancing diffusion. No, it's not. I mean, not unless you're temperature changes are enormous. You got to go to the, you know, a, a Kelvin scale. And you think about going from 37 to 39 degrees, right? Or Celsius in that case, but swap to Kelvin, um, right? It, it's minuscule in terms of the, the total thermal energy. Got nothing to do, almost nothing to do with it. What does it have to do with? Oh, viscosity of the solution, right? This, nobody talks about that. So again, uh, we're getting in the weeds, but I think there's, you know, we really want to make sure that we're we're both accurate 
and util utilizing these, these principles as much as we can, just to give students a foundation for understanding lots of things in physiology. Here's another one. Here's one. This is one where you know we came across um, a, a sort of a misconception, and and it, it's probably still fairly broad, and that's the capillary filtration. The, cap, the sort of classical model of capillary filtration is that capillaries are being perfused, and they're they're filtering at their arterial end, and they're reabsorbing at their venous end. And the little graph down there I sketched at the bottom shows the, the transition of the, the primary driving forces. Well, for about 20 years, the people in capillary dynamics have been sort of saying, will you please stop teaching that? <laughs> um, because it's, they found that it's really not accurate. Um, lots of things, lots of components of this the premise of this original model are not accurate. And so what did we do? Well, we try to convey the accurate model or what, you know, what's thought to be the more accurate model uh, now. And that's that a perfused capillary uh, filters end to end. If you see the little graphic there under the capillary, right? The, the blood hydrostatic pressure is dominant along the full length of the capillary and you drive filtration. Okay, well, we know that filtration is dominant, but this sounds like it's the only thing that's happening. Well, that's because capillaries actually regularly transition, and we're all at least somewhat aware of this probably, is that they transition between perfused and unperfused states, right? There's a continual vasomotion uh, of the arteriolar smooth muscle. In skeletal muscle, for instance, the, their uh, arterioles um, go through a cycle of constriction and dilation multiple times per minute. And so what that does is it transition us, transitions us from a perfused capillary to an unperfused capillary, in which case the hydrostatic pressure falls and the oncotic pressure, the blood oncotic pressure is now dominant and it's all reabsorption. So instead of those two things happening in, in the same capillary, they're happening, well, they are, but they're separated temporally in time. Now, even more interestingly, if we go to this constricted capillary that's sort of acutely constricted and we look at a third scenario, chronically constricted, uh, unperfused, Right? And we're not talking hours here, right? This would be minutes. Um, what happens if we start to filter again? And that happens because the reabsorption is drawing proteins up against that capillary wall. And if you think about it again, what that's doing is enhancing a filtrative force now, right? The interstitial oncotic pressure is coming back up, right? Where while we were filtering, we were sort of washing those proteins away. When you're reabsorbing, you're washing them back up. And because they're sort of you know, trapped on one side or the other, we're changing that oncotic pressure gradient and we're back to filtration. And so the, the long story here is that, first of all, we wanna be accurate, right? Convey the, the most current understanding of, of physiology that we can. Um, but there's other details sort of that are really cool that come out in this, right? One being in this scenario, if capillaries are, are switching between perfused and unperfused, well, what's the ratio? Well, it turns out if you do a little bit of math, it's probably about 10 to one, 10 unperfused to one perfused. And so it's sort of like this one cap and it keeps alternating, right? And it's sort of like a new, it's a new way to sort of view most vascular tissues, right? And what they're doing, it's sort of like, oh, they're, per you know, I, I sort of think of it as like lights going off like sporadically on a Christmas tree or something, right? Where it's like, oh, this area is being perfused. Now it's not, and this area is, right? And it just keeps shifting. And that comes back to allow you to talk about, you know, intrinsic controls and things like that, all kinds of, all kinds of cool stuff. But um, it is pretty interesting that the classical model has sort of persisted for so long past its sort of expiration date. I always taught the uh, classical model and uh, what kind of escaped me, honestly, was the uh, dynamic nature of vasomotion and how much that impacts on the whole thing. Uh, I mean, it's still basically the same science. It's just that we have to understand this occurs superimposed on those vessels being perfused or not perfused or poorly perfused. Just you know, yeah. taking everything in, in contact. Yeah, it's really cool. If you, if you, I did a sort of a, and it's not necessarily accurate, but it's probably ballpark. I did sort of a back of the envelope calculation. Um, and if you, if you make an assumption about capillary numbers and 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 that's an assumption, but capillary numbers and their volume, capillaries have a, a total volume of several liters, 
right? The, the potential to hold several liters. You only have a couple liters of plasma, right? Two, three liters of plasma. So it can't all be in the capillaries and actually very little of it. 10% of your blood is in the capillaries at any given moment. So it's kind of crazy. Like all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, this has to be occurring because you can't perfuse them all, all the time or you'd have no blood in your arteries or veins, right? It'd be, it'd be all pooled there in your capillaries. So yeah, it, it just, it brings up a lot of different cool little elements that I think are outside of the, our norm, at least it was outside of my norm of teaching you know, cardiovascular physiology in this case. This comes back to the fun we've been talking about, being able to share those bits of insights with students is like so much fun. Yeah. Especially if they understand what you're talking about. Yep. All right, here's another one about um, sort of the, the constructing and deconstructing. And this is sort of the beginning of it. And I don't wanna to get too bogged down here. No, we don't wanna, we don't wanna keep you all day. Um, Everyone teaches the ECG, right? Uh, and this is leading into that Wiggers diagram that I was that I was had previously brought up. Um, we all teach the ECG. We you know we teach what the what the the waves uh, are are caused by uh, in terms of the uh, electrical events, atrial depolarization, ventricular events, that sort of thing. Um, but my goal, like I was teaching that for years, and then I was sort of like. Well, the electrical is the stimulus for the mechanical. How can I get them to like look at the ECG and then infer the mechanical? It's like looking at the stimulus and being able to infer like well, what follows from that. And if you look at and what really happened was it opened my eyes because you know we oftentimes I think a lot of people think the segments, the the dashed blue lines there, the isoelectric line, or are sort of like well they're just sort of the in between places, and it's like no, they're just. They're just places you don't have a dipole, but they're no less important than the waves, you, the, right? The waves are obvious because they're sticking up or down, right? But the, but the isoelectric components are absolutely just as important and mean just as much as the waves do. And when I made that realization and tried to tie it together to see my action potentials there, the atrial ones on top and then the ventricular ones on bottom, and sort of, and again, without getting into the explanation if, you, if you're not already doing this, um, of like what creates the wave. So it, you know, is, is partially depolarized atria, atria or, or repolarized or partially depolarized uh, ventricular cells. Um, that in between, you're sort of seeing that like, well, the cells are depolarized. Well, and again, we teach this, right? When they're depolarized, that's when the intracellular calcium rises and they contract. Ah, now I can start to link the stimulus, the action potentials to the mechanical events. And a cool little bit here is that if you look over at that TP segment, it's isoelectric, but guess what? Everybody's relaxed because you're not on a plateau of an action potential. And so the three segments, right? PR, ST, and TP do not all mean the same thing, right? Which I think is kind of novel for, for a lot of students to hear that the, like, the waves aren't the end all be all of this thing. Plus the, the isoelectric components aren't even all the same. And you might think, well, it's too much, right? And my students don't need to like, they don't need all that detail. It takes too long. If you don't do this, they don't understand that connection between the electrical events and the mechanical. It, or it's really hard for them to make that connection. This just points right at it because they know the action potential is, a, is the stimulus to initiate the contraction. Eric, either you're reading my mind or I'm re reading yours. Uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, if you don't show the students this whole slide, or basically the action potentials in the ECG superimposed in the same time frame, uh, the students don't understand the ECG. I mean, you can say e ECG, P wave, QRS complex, C wave, P wave, atrial depolarization, blah, blah, blah. Well, you can say that, but unless you understand what's happening electrically in those myocytes, can't comprehend the ECG. So it's like you really, you're, you're, not, you're not helping anybody by oversimplifying too much. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, pertinent information. My, my, my revelation with this one in particular was that if I don't convey this, it seems, it seems like, okay, I have to give more explanation to get to this next level. And, and that's true. But if I don't do this, I'm conveying nothing. I mean, that was, that was my, like, I feel like I'm like, well, now they're just memorizing. 
in which case there's no logic tied to it. They don't, they can't, they can't apply it. They can't interpret, like, I want my students to be able to point to the ECG and tell me where, like, what ventricular filling is doing or, right? Like all kind, like I want them to be able to think it through and, and they can't do that without this sort of level of, of comprehension. And I think that's true through the book in a lot of places where we're giving a little bit more explanation. It's not more content. It's a little bit more explanation, but the goal is that much greater thing. It's that like sort of getting us away from, you know, the characters that are all randomly separated to a story that's, you know, occurring and has a conclusion that makes sense. I, I think everybody at the webinar already knows this, but I just wanted to kind of call attention to one point. Coming up in the next slide, we're going to be looking at the Wiggers diagram. Please pay attention to the ST segment on the ECG. Look at the plateau phase of the ventricular myocyte action potentials and see how important that is to understanding what's happening as far as mechanical stuff during, during the cardiac cycle. All right, and whoops, uh oh. There we go. Sorry, I jumped one too far. So here we have, so the classical Wiggers is down there in the lower left, right? And, it, and if your students can look at that and make sense of it, you know, without you spending quite a bit of time, um, you know, they're amazing, first of all, because <laughs> um, there's a lot going on there, right? But that's how you typically see it in a textbook. What we've tried to do is take con uh, concepts that are that complicated and kind of pull them apart, right? So that you're explaining, so you can see our, our deconstructed wiggers there in the middle, you're kind of explaining it piece by piece, right? In, the, in A, the PR segment is, right? We're pointing down to where, you know, that's where atrial pressure is gonna rise. In B, we're pointing, you know, to, from the ST segment down to ventricular pressure, right? And so on. In, in C, we're showing you like, well, what happens to, you know, um, ventricular volume, blood moving through the ventricle along this pathway of atrial and ventricular pressure changes. And again, it becomes, it becomes intuitive. Like what I want my students to be able to do if I were to sketch an ECG is draw the atrial pressure wave, the ventricular pressure wave and the, and the volume changes. And, it's, and, I, and this is one I do all the time. I put a ventricular volume trace on the exam and I ask them all kinds of like, if you understand that, you understand all kinds of things, right? Because you understand where the valves are opening and closing. You know, you know, what's the difference between passive and active filling. You know, you can, you can calculate stroke volume. You see what EDV is. You see what ESV is. Like all kinds of content there um, that where if they understand that trace, they're really understanding the sequence of events in the cardiac cycle. And of course, the, uh, a key component of all this is that, well, you got to bring it all back together too. So we do give them the full Wiggers diagram. We just try to explain it piece by piece first and then say, okay, here it is all laid out temporally so that, you know, any vertical line sort of matches up. Jerry, anything to add? Okay. All right. We're getting there. Um, so a couple more things. So here's one about what we call, I like to call mental chunking, right? Remember that idea where I said, you know, phone numbers and social security numbers had hyphens in them originally when people had to memorize them um, because it'll, it, your, your, your recall went up when they were chunked, right? So this is a stealing a term from um, psychology, um, but it's like trying to put a, a significant amount of content into one block. And so an example we have here is a, a pressure volume loop, uh, a ventricular pressure volume loop. And there's a lot going on here. Um, but remember, they would have already gone through that Wiggers diagram. We'd have explained that. And then they see this thing and they're like, okay, what is this, right? Like, what's this doing for me? And when you march through this, and then the students get to the point where they can march through this uh, 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 counterclockwise, they see that cardiac cycle from the view of the ventricle. Right, and then it adds other things as well. It adds, right? You can see your 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 stroke volume, you, but the area of it, right? Work in terms of fluid dynamics is is pressure times volume. Ooh, well, guess what? That's the area of this curve, right? And so we can see how much work the ventricle is doing to move the stroke volume that it's moving. Oh, we can get that efficiency, right? And you you know you don't need to use things like this um, for every concept, 
But for some, it makes a lot of sense because it pulls everything together, puts it in one spot and essentially tells a story. Do they need help with the story? Sure. The, and I'll uh, come back if we need to, Jerry, but you know, in many textbooks, this is what you see, right? You, there are pressure volume loops there, right? If they include one, um, but they're sort of like there because they feel like, I guess the authors felt like they should have one there. Um, but uh, you know, there's no, there's no guidance for the student to intellectually walk through this figure. And that's something we consistently try to do is give the students the tools either in the legend and in the um, figure itself so that they can intellectually walk through the figure. They, they can see how the dots are connected, how things, there's a sequence to events, uh, for instance. Eric, could you back up to the previous one real quickly? I could try. For a second. Yeah, I, I just want to make a pitch here. Um, again, be very easy to look at this in a textbook and say, you know, this is sort of graduate level or, or upper division physiology level stuff. I, I don't think I'm going to show this to my students. But the fact of the matter is, it's just an extension of the uh, Wigger diagram. Let's say you've already invested 45 minutes to an hour in discussing the Wigger diagram, the cardiac cycle. Why not spend another five minutes showing them the pressure volume loop? Like Eric said, you can walk the students through it if they understood the the uh, cardiac cycle, they can do this, no problem at all. This allows you to take, say, compare the work outputs of the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And it's crystal clear. They both handle the same volume of blood, but guess which ventricle works much harder and why? That yeah. comes through with this type of thing. The, the tools, the application skills you can, you can like spur off of these kinds of things are huge, right? Like I was just thinking of one where you look at, um, a normal uh, PV loop versus uh, somebody with hypertension. And you immediately see, right, you end up with a much taller, narrower, uh, potentially narrower uh, loop there. And it's like, like, it becomes very obvious. Oh, they're doing more pressure work and less volume work. Oh, it's inefficient, right? It, it tells you why hypertension can be a problem, right? As opposed to students saying, oh, hypertension's bad, right? And like you, you list some things, but they don't really know why they're bad. Here, that sort of screams at you. It says you're you're doing more work, generating more pressure to move less volume. That can't be good, right? So just it it, it sometimes these chunking tools allow you to take that next step and really apply things. You you know, in some cases you you know you don't have to use all of them. You know, you might pick and choose the ones you want to use, but in many cases they'll they'll expand the repertoire of what you can ask the students to do. Uh, here's one I, I love because this is one where, again, I, for years, I taught all the, you know, all the bells and whistles of blood pressure regulation, right? What affects stroke volume? What affects heart rate? Cardiac outputs change in, uh, you know, peripheral resistance, renal effects for, you know, volume loss and retention, blah, blah, right? A million different things, all the hormones. And the students are like, wow, like that is just a lot, right? Well, what if you look at blood pressure? as sort of like, well, the, the pressure in your arteries is based upon really proportional to the volume that's in the arteries in any given moment. Okay, well, that means that inflow on the left there, sort of spurring off our aorta and outflow on the right side, it's really the ratio of those two that's gonna determine the volume in between. So really, right, it, anything that increases cardiac output would make blood pressure go up. And anything that decreases runoff on the other end would make blood pressure go up, right? Because it would trap more blood in between. Think about it, we all teach systolic and diastolic pressures, right? Uh, right? Systolic and diastolic arterial blood pressures. Look at this model. Think about it. Your, your heart is an intermittent pump, right? So cardiac output is, is, you know, goes up and then it goes to zero. Then it goes up and then it goes to zero. Does runoff on the right instant you know, over the course of a second or two or three change? Nope. So in other words, when you're ejecting blood, volume and pressure go up. When you're not ejecting blood from the heart, runoff continues and volume's falling. Systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic. And we just try to do that endlessly, right? Is to get that bigger picture. So the students, all the, you know, you, know, you bring up aldosterone later on. It's sort of like, well, how does aldosterone fit in here, right? And then you get into, you know, 
fluid retention, you know, sodium retention, fluid retention, blood volume goes up, you know, go to Starling's, you know, mechanism of the heart, Starling's law of the heart. Guess what? Stroke volume goes up, input goes up, fits right into the model. And you can do that with every single component of blood pressure regulation. One of the earlier slides we showed uh, featured keys to have, how to handle this and be, be effective. Uh, one of the points was to simplify before elaborating. Classic example right here. Yep. Sure, you can get into a lot of stuff, you know, detailed stuff about how to, you know, quantify blood pressure and, um, you know, things that you can tweak to adjust it one way or another. But why not show them something like this first? So you get them in on the, the playing field with you, and then you can get into some of the details. Yeah. It and again, it it makes it work better. Then all the details start to make sense, right? Because now the yeah. details, the actions of those hormones and those, you know, those, those vasoconstrictive things and other, you know, other amounts going, going on are going to fit logically into this framework. Now they know why they're happening. Oops, sorry. Uh, here's another one, uh, embedded questions, right? This is a big one for us. Um, we have this pedagogical tool called, can you put it together? Um, and what we really try to do is get students to employ the factual content they just read about in application settings. Right. And so, again, how this is different from a lot of from a lot of current textbooks. Um, here's one is this paraphrase from another book. Um, and this question was considered higher level um, at the bottom there. If the heart ventricle becomes damaged, my first point was there's more than one ventricle. Um, what specific waves of the ECG would be different? To me, that sounds like you, the student could memorize which waves go with which chambers and you're there. I don't understand how that's an application-based question. Whereas if you're trying to teach the logic, you know, the logical sequence of events uh, in the cardiac cycle, electrical to mechanical, you know, then we can ask questions like this, which is we give them a scenario, uh, systemic hypertension, we give them a result, ventricular hypertrophy. And we do this a lot in these questions where we give them an actual clinical scenario. Um, or, or, or a physiological scenario, it doesn't have to be clinical. Um, and then what we know about dipole current, how would this condition alter the ECG, right? And so now it's sort of like, we've shifted it away from this sort of factual recall to, hmm, I need to think about what, you know, hypertrophy means with regard to the dipole current. I need to think about how the dipole current relates to the ECG waves. Now they're gonna end up with an answer but it's because they understand the logical connection between those things, as opposed to memorizing which waves are which. This, this question simply asks people to put things in context a little bit more and think about how they fit together. Uh, and the outcome is, uh, I mean, if you can answer the second question, you simply have a better understanding for the physiology. And I, I myself, you know, I want any physician that's treating me to be able to answer both of these questions. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. It's sort of like, and the, the one I came to earlier, the, the point I was trying to make earlier where, you know, I, I felt years ago, like, I was like, well, what am I imparting upon these students? What skills are they walking away with? And it, it got a little scary, right? Because I'm like, I'm sitting there, with, you know, pre-nursing, you know, pre-med, pre-dent, all these different sort of preclinical tracks. And it's a little like, wow, I'm not teaching you to think. <laughs> that's scary, right? Because it's like, that's what I really want you to be able to do later on when I'm in your office. So um, here's an example of um, physiological functions that aren't often taught, but that we found are, are sort of critical to survival, essentially, like they're really important. Uh, this is called the ferrous linguist effect. And the, you know, the, the, the gist of this is that in little tiny vessels, blood doesn't flow the way it does in larger ones. What happens is if you look at the blood vessel there at the, at the bottom right, the red cells tend to line up uh, along the axis of the vessel. And what that does is it reduces, and, and you think back to the, the factors affecting um, blood viscosity, and that is a component of resistance to blood flow. What it does is it reduces the resistance to blood flow through these micro vessels. And you can see the size there, less than 0.3 millimeters. Well, that's most of the vessels in your body, right? And so this, this 
you know, physical phenomena of the, you know, the colloid suspension of cells sort of aligning along the axis makes blood flow through little tiny vessels possible, right? If that red line didn't dip in the little tiny vessels there, the blood, vas blood viscosity didn't drop dramatically in those little vessels, we would need a heart that's probably three, four, five times bigger than it is currently because that, that series resistance in our vascular circuits would be that much higher. You'd need huge blood pressures. You'd need to have a heart like a giraffe has, right? That has to generate very high blood pressures to you know, drive against significant resistance, much more significant resistances. Just a bit of a teaser on this one um, without going into detail because we were almost out of time. Uh, if, if you understand the Fairhouse Lindquist effect, you might just have a handle on why hematic roots in males and females are different and the control systems are just fine with that. But just for now, right, Eric? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really cool one, right? Because I think we're all aware that, that hematocrits are different in males and females, but it's sort of like, well, females don't just need less oxygen, right? There's a <laughs> physiological explanation that, that, that links this and it's, and it's tied to this, which is kind of cool. Yeah. All right, concluding remarks. So our, our, our take home advice, um, you know, if, if you like our, what we're trying to like convey and, and promote here um, is that, and many of you may already be doing this, but you know, we always try to tell, you know, I try to tell the, the, the junior faculty members that I advise um, is that I know you, you have to start with the notes and the PowerPoints maybe, um, you know, it's kind of like a backup, like what if I get lost and uh, you know, I'm gonna forget certain things. Um, but the better that people learn the content, the more so we feel that, you know, you sort of, the more you step away from the notes, even step away from the PowerPoints, and, you know, we have PowerPoints <laughs> for the text, um, but I, you know, I don't use them because, in my teaching, because I like to start with nothing and build a story, and so I am like, you know, I'm a dinosaur, I, I walk in with, you know, 18 different colors of chalk or, you know, markers, and, um, and I just build a story from there. Um, and again, to do that right completely, uh, find the right tools for the job. And hopefully we're, you know, that was our goal for the last you know, decade is to really provide the tools so that people could teach in ways that we feel are more effective. Um, it's a hell of a lot more fun to do that, right? As we were talking about before, it's, it's, it's challenging, but it's like, it's so much more fun than just walking in and, you know, and conveying the, the content of physiology, right? Ta telling them the steps. Um, get creative, right? You know, what works for one student? As, and again, that's, that's why I felt like I had to become as much an expert as possible in like sort of all of these content areas because you have to understand it at a higher level so that when a student asks a question, you can like, you can retool your explanation. You can re-gear it, right? You understand it well enough that you can shift what you're saying because you know you won't be wrong, right? In other words, you comprehend it well enough that you can modify your explanation out of, out of your, you know, beyond your script to reach the student, right? Because sometimes you, you're, you pack, the way you're pack, packaging that explanation isn't working and you need to be able to like, okay, like bring out version two or version three of that explanation and just keep tweaking it until it, until it fits. And that really does jump into my, my, passion for turning lectures into active learning, right? I really push my students, like, like listening, right? Is one of these, you've seen the learning, the pyramid, right? Where learning effectiveness, passive learning first to active learning. And, you know, listening is, is low on the totem pole uh, in terms of sort of conveying understanding. And I say, unless you get the students to really pay attention to really buy into the story. Because if they walk, and I've had students tell me this, it's like if they walk, I have the students that are like, I don't have to study outside of class because they walk away with the comprehension, right? They study out of class to make sure they've got the details. They are not studying out of, outside of class to pick up the story and, the, and, the, and how those pieces fit together. Um, and so it almost reduces the workload on those students that it really buy in because they're not left with, you know, floating facts and concepts that aren't tied together. And hopefully you'll 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 love the difference, right? Doing that really does 
excite us and I think uh, excites our students because they start, they realize just, they're grasping something bigger. I just want to say, I think we're all blessed to have physiology as the subject that we teach. Uh, it's the most awesome science to study and, you know, just to think about. And uh, we're hoping very much that what we've shared with you today uh, helps you to enjoy it. You know, and, uh, and, and by you enjoying it, your students are going to enjoy it as well more. So thanks. Absolutely. Yep. We really appreciate you guys coming and, um, you know, happy to answer questions here or, or beyond this webinar as well. Thanks very much. And I just to jump in here, um, I think we'd all be remiss to, uh, to not picture that your, your wonderful book that you've been uh, kind of hinting around at uh, mechanisms and logic in human physiology. It says 10 years in the making, you said, right, Eric? Yeah. 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 So all of the kind of it, it, this is what kind of pulls together all of the the heavy lifting that you've been doing over these past 10 years to help someone who's who's interested in teaching this way kind of be able to put it into practice immediately, kind of hit the ground running. Yeah, that, that's really it, is that I think this book could for, for those, especially those novice instructors, really like accelerates the learning curve right it, it gets you to where I, it took me 20 years to get to i think right because I'm, I'm, I'm i put my heart and soul into sort of trying to we did right but but trying to get people to what we took years and decades to understand and and learn about how our students were learning or what they weren't learning and trying to put it into a tool that then we could share 